This video is brought to you by friend of the channel Squarespace. Stick around to learn more about them as well as a special offer they're making available through my channel. Gamers, I am back from Japan and the cat is out of the bag. I got to play Final Fantasy 16 and interview Yoshi P and his squad of legends. Also, I managed to kind of insult Yoshi P, which is generally not a good idea. If you want the full details on that story and the game, I'll leave a link to my impressions video below. It's nice to be back down under for many reasons, but for one big reason in particular, this week is Lightfall, and I, for real, would have turned down a hands-on session with Final Fantasy XVI and an interview with Yoshi P if it meant I had to skip the Lightfall launch. The timing is lined up beautifully, and I am very keen to basically spend the next two weeks of my life doing nothing but playing the game that seems to have ruined every other game. Because did you see that Suicide Squad gameplay reveal? Holy hell, one day Destiny is going to have to pay for its cries, because with every publisher squeezing whatever IP they own into a live service looter shooter bucket, someone is going to have to take some damn accountability and I vote Bungie. But look, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's rewind a bit and take it from the top. This week, Sony hosted one of its State of Play webinars, making sure to set expectations at the right level by telegraphing that we should expect to see some VR titles, some third-party stuff, and a deep dive on the Suicide Squad, kill your hype. I mean, kill the Justice League. The show opened as promised with a look at five upcoming VR games that will drop sometime this year. No date for any of them. The Foglands was perhaps the most promising looking, being a roguelike shooter with an interesting setting and cast of characters. Green Hell VR is the PSVR 2 port of the PC VR survival game set in the Amazon jungle. Great reviews for that one over on Steam, so that's a nice get for Sony. Synapse comes from End Dreams, a studio who is certainly no stranger to VR as they put out a bunch of titles, including a Far Cry VR spin-off. This one is sporting some very arresting art design, some fast moving gunplay and some jazz hand superpowers reminiscent of Control or Bioshock. Journey to Foundation looks to transport you to Isaac Asimov's ill-fated world the same way that the Apple TV show did, only with less Lee Pace. Sad times. And finally, Before Your Eyes is meant to be absolutely wonderful. It won a boatload of awards when it was released on PC. You play it with your eyes by blinking? That advances time and changes the scene, and it's meant to be a moving story that will stay with you long after you take that headset off. So yeah, nice to see Sony leading with the VR stuff, demonstrating their commitment to the hardware they've just released. Hopefully, many more big VR announcements to come later. After that, there was a Destiny Lightfall trailer. Pff, no one cares about that game. Chia is a charming looking 3D platformer that got a release date March 21st, and this one will be available day one for PS Plus Extra and Premium subscribers. Not too often that Sony does that, so hopefully this one delivers. Getting to the business end of things now, the team behind Res Infinite and Tetris Effect, two absolute masterpieces, are putting out something called Humanity. Take a look. <laughs> So obviously this is Lemmings, but 3D and cooler looking, and I'm 1000% down for this. Such a weird and interesting concept that only seems to get more weird and more interesting as the trailer goes on, pulling out all sorts of weird stuff that we've definitely not seen in Lemmings. This one is also gonna have an optional VR mode, which is really nice. Plus there's a demo out for it right now on the PSN. That demo is only up for a little while though, so getting quick. But yeah, this looks really awesome to be honest, and it's launching sometime in May this year. Goodbye Volcano High is an angsty teenage drama thing about furries leaving school and, you know, talking about whatever kids talk about these days. It's got a release date too, June 15th. There's a new Naruto game on the way as well. I know nothing about Naruto, so I'm not even going to try and summarize this. It's out sometime this year. Baldur's Gate 3. All right, here we go. So this one has been an early access since Noah wore short pants, with the team at Larian steadily building it out over on PC. Feedback from players is fantastic. Everyone is loving it. Larian do not miss, and it looks like they are on target as usual. They'd earlier flagged that a 1.0 would arrive in August, but we were just expecting a PC launch then. This new trailer has announced that the game would also be coming to PS5 and it got an official release date August 31st. This immediately begged the question, would this game also be coming to Xbox? People were quick to assume that Sony had nabbed some exclusive deal, but the truth was quite different. Larry and have every intention of releasing the game on Xbox ASAP, but they're having difficulty finalizing the development of the port due to the requirement of split-screen co-op, which is an important part of the experience they're designing. People then guess that this is probably an issue specific to the Xbox Series S, which has caused some challenges for developers in the past. I mean, just look at the recent Series S port of Wild Hearts for evidence of that. Larian have said that they're working their hardest and they'd still love to hit that August 31st release date on Xbox, but until they're 100% confident in the quality of the product, they don't feel comfortable announcing it. And you know what? That's pretty damn cool. I respect that a lot. 
Hopefully they get the port working well because Baldur's Gate 3 is looking amazing and it'd be a real shame if Xbox had to miss out on this one. Wayfinders is a new co-op MMORPG light from the people behind Battle Chasers who formerly created Darksiders. It's looking nice. Beta tests are running at the moment. Sign up if you're keen. Capcom then went full beast mode, hard carrying the stream with two knockout reveals. The first was for the final three launch characters for Street Fighter 6. And while the hairy chest of Zangief sent many heart a flutter, it was this stretch from Kami that sent the internet into an uncontrolled raging thirst. Shout out to this fan edit, by the way. We then got a new look at the Resident Evil 4 remake, and I cannot believe that this is out this month. My God, this trailer looked absolutely superb. Capcom, man, they are on a huge tear right now. And apparently we can expect another Monster Hunter World game later this year. That's the rumor. Absolutely massive year for Capcom ahead. Okay, Suicide Squad time. So before we begin, I think it's important we don't come to any definitive judgments about a game before we've seen the entire thing or we've played it for ourselves. I remember seeing Guardians of the Galaxy and thinking, oh boy, that looks kind of shit. That ended up being one of my favorite games of the year and one of the best written games I've ever played. So yeah, we've got to keep an open mind. Having said that, this latest showcase for the Suicide Squad was so bad that it immediately deflated every bit of hype that I'd been clinging to for the past eight years while waiting patiently for Rocksteady's follow-up to the legendary Arkham Trilogy. And sure, we had seen some gameplay already and it looked fun, but when we saw it, it kind of looked like trailer gameplay rather than actual gameplay. So there was still a lot of room in our imagination for how this could be really interesting and immersive and a Rocksteady-like superhero experience. But this gameplay shot from the perspective of all four heroes showing large portions of a mission, showing these fucking purple pustules on the tanks and the helicopters and Captain Boomerang using a sniper rifle and King Shark flying around like he's Astro Boy or something. My God, what the fuck is this? Like we all knew that Rocksteady were making a live service looter shooter, right? And I know some people were already like, nah, man, it's going to suck. But I was huffing that hopium, massive rips on the hopium bong, being like... <sighs> No oh, man, it's gonna be really good, Rocks that he don't miss. But man, the come down after seeing that trailer, I am very sad and very hungry. Chief among my complaints is that this does not seem remotely immersive or true to the characters at all. Why the fuck is Harley Quinn zipping around like Spider-Man? Why do all the characters share the same arsenal of weapons? Why is an anthropomorphic shark using a weapon in the first place? Why does Captain Boomerang not, you know, boomerang shit? For a studio that almost single-handedly invented the modern superhero video game by delivering one of the most immersive games of all time to then create this, I, I just don't understand. Things only got worse in the post-game discussion video where Rocksteady started showing the back end of all of this and oh man, the guns were like, oh, we have SMGs and sniper rifles and assault rifles and miniguns. Like, wow, cool, never seen any of those before. And it's a shared loot pool. Why are all the characters using the same guns? It doesn't make any sense. And then we get to the stat screen with all these numbers and tiny percentage points and arrows pointing up and down and colored loot and oh my God. And to be clear, I like this game. I'm known for liking this kind of game. I love me a looter shooter, but why is the Suicide Squad game a looter shooter like this? Why is Rocksteady spending their time making this type of game when they could make a single player Superman game, for example, which is what they were rumored to be working on at some point. I'll tell you why the live service dollars. Even in this presentation, they started talking about the cosmetics and the cash shop and the battle pass and the who knows what else. Again, I am fine with this stuff in other games. I play Destiny for God's sake. I like Borderlands. I like Warframe. I'm one of the three people who liked Outriders. Yeah, man, I'm just really bummed that this is what Rocksteady have been working on. I'm not alone, by the way. The reception to this has been nearly universally negative. Like ratios on videos are in the doldrums. The subreddit's on fire. Social media is awash with hot takes dunking on this. At one point, the PS5 subreddit, the game subreddit, and the PC game subreddit were all essentially devoted to dunking on this game. If you wanted to get free up votes, just type Suicide Squad bad and watch the karma roll in. I really can't recall a circumstance in which public perception has swung so firmly against a game in so little time. Like I said, I'm absolutely keeping an open mind. I would love, love, for this segment to age like soft cheese in the sun and people can throw it back at my face in May as proof positive that YouTubers are dumbasses and should never be listened to. I've already provided plenty of ammunition for that over my career and I would be happy for this clip to add to the pile. I guess we'll find out when Suicide Squad launches for PC, Xbox and PlayStation on May 26th. I do not expect that Warner Brothers will send me a review code after this block, so I guess I will find out with the rest of you. Okay, so that's a wrap on the state of play, but what else went down this week? Well, some big news out of Activision, they're pivoting in their plans for this year's Call of Duty. 
It was reported by Jason Schreier of Bloomberg that this year we would not see a new Call of Duty release. Instead, they'd work to deliver premium add-on content to complement Modern Warfare 2. Well, that's still sort of true, but it seems as though Activision are changing the label on the tin and upping the price. Schreier is now reporting that this year we'll see a full standalone release for Call of Duty. This entry is being developed by Sledgehammer Games, who previously did Vanguard, and that did not go so well, prompting a pivot in COD's planned release schedule going forward. That change will apparently come later, I guess, as this standalone entry will reportedly sell for $70 and contain a continuation of the storyline present in Modern Warfare 2. It's also reported that this new release will reuse some aspects of the previous Modern Modern Warfare, the one released just a few months ago. And if that's true, then there are sure to be questions about whether or not this new release is really worth that full price tag, or if Activision are just seeing how much they can get away with. Spoiler alert, when it comes to repackaging and reselling old content, you can get away with a lot. Not naming any name. <laughs> Bungie. <laughs> Sorry, mm, don't know what happened. None of this is confirmed, so take it all with a grain of salt. It will likely be some time before we get an official reveal announcement. A quick lightning round to finish off. Elden Ring wins Game of the Year again. This time it's from the annual DICE Awards where Elden Ring took out top honors at just about the same time as the game turned one. Can you believe it's been a year since Elden Ring first released? If this were a Sony game, we'd be expecting a remaster announcement soon. Birthday news was accompanied by the announcement that Elden Ring had sold 20 million copies, which to be clear, is a lot of copies. Speaking of which, Hogwarts Legacy sales numbers have come in and they are just about as huge as everyone anticipated. After taking over Twitch and becoming the third most concurrently played single player game ever on Steam, it turns out that Hogwarts sold 12 million units in its opening period. As you gotta guess, this game has very long legs when it comes to stuff like Christmas time, or if they ever end up making that rumored Hogwarts Legacy TV adaptation, which apparently is being tossed around inside the halls of HBO. Speaking of book adaptations, did you know we can expect a bunch more Lord of the Rings movies? I know. Fucking terrible news, right? But it's happening anyway. This is courtesy of the new IP rights holder Embracer Group. They signed a deal with New Line Cinema and Warner Brothers for an undisclosed number of movies based on... Who knows, man? Probably one of those songs that stretch for like four pages that no one reads. Moving right along, we had an inkling that this would happen, but Nintendo have now confirmed it. They will not be at E3 this year. Kind of regret booking my tickets so early, knowing how small the turnout will be. Microsoft had better put on one hell of a show. It's not all bad news on the Nintendo front, though. Nintendo have just announced a Direct for March 9th. The sole focus? The Mario movie. An entire Direct devoted to the movie. I'm not gonna lie. I can't wait, the movie looks awesome. Capcom have announced that Resident Evil 4 Remake is getting a VR mode exclusive to the PSVR 2. The news is not altogether surprising given that they've done exactly this with both Resident Evil 7 and more recently with Village. The exclusive thing kind of sucks, but if Sony are providing the funding for the development, then you really can't blame them. The VR mode will be a free update to all owners of Resident Evil 4 Remake. EA is apparently surveying people on the possibility of Dead Space 2 or Dead Space 3 remakes. Hopefully everyone's ticking yes because the word on the street is that the remake hasn't sold a bunch and yeah EA aren't exactly known for their charitable approach to passion projects and finally one more birthday to celebrate this week is the Steam Deck which arrived basically everywhere but Australia 12 months ago and is still nowhere to be seen at our girded by sea home it's a shame because the Steam Deck is basically the greatest handheld ever released and everybody needs one anyway happy birthday to Gaben's big deck I look forward to the sequel deck 2 too fast too deck love to sell that one in a paper bag so what got announced or delayed this week? Well, not a whole lot to be honest, but this looks hella cool. Roll it, Austin. It's rare that a mobile game spin-off elicits genuine enthusiasm since the vast majority of them are lazy cash grabs, completely devoid of personality or charm. That may well end up being the case here for this one too, but with a reveal trailer this delightful, we can permit ourselves a moment's hope. This is Mighty Doom, and it's the kind of video game that the Doom Slayer might play when he's on the John or whatever he sits on when he makes number two. Does he do it in the suit like Master Chief? Reception to Mighty Doom has been anything but universally positive, with a number of people disappointed at the cartoonish aesthetic and the fact that it's a mobile game, but I think this looks fun, I really do. So I'm keeping an open mind and pre-registering for this one when it launches on March 21st, Android and iOS. Vampire the Masquerade Swan Song is a narrative-led RPG set in the Vampire Masquerade universe. This one dropped on the Epic Games Store a little while back, which is probably why you've never heard of it. 
Plus, the reviews were fairly mid, with the title landing at a fair 67 on OpenCritic. Still, if you're interested, the game has just been announced for a Steam release on May 18th. The team behind Forza Horizon 5 have just announced the game's next expansion. The last one was Hot Wheels themed, sending you into the clouds to race around on impossibly designed tracks in all manner of crazy diecast hot rods. This expansion? It's rally themed. It's just, it's just rally. Lots of dirt and sliding around, I guess. I'm sorry I'm not more enthused for this one. I'm really showing myself to be the fake racing fan that I am, but I was really just hoping for like a Batman themed expansion or something where we could race the Batmobile around Gotham. Was that a realistic expectation? Absolutely not, but you gotta admit that'd be sick. Anyway, Forza Horizon's Rally Adventure arrives on PC and Xbox on March 29th. The very promising looking Lies of P got a release window August of this year. If you haven't seen this one before, it's probably the closest thing we're ever gonna get to a Bloodborne sequel since FromSoft essentially refused to acknowledge the existence of arguably their greatest release. Lies of P is actually based on Pinocchio, only a really fucked up version that probably wouldn't fly with Disney's target demographic. The trailers have all looked superb and early impressions have been strong. He is hoping that this one delivers since Souls Lies are generally pretty hit and miss unless they're coming from Miyazaki himself. And finally, the award for most disappointingly low-key announcement of the week goes to Mortal Kombat 12. After years of hype and speculation, that finally got announced this week. You want to know how? In a fucking earnings call, when Warner Brothers just blurted it out in a lame attempt to convince investors to give them more money, robbing the studio and fans of a long-awaited reveal that NetherRealm really could have made a meal out of. Note to executives out there, not that any of you would watch this show, but please don't do this. Just let the game makers announce the games they're making, okay? Not you. This makes us hate you more than we already do. Anyway, no date for this, obviously, but we can certainly expect an official reveal of Mortal Kombat 12 sometime soon. So what came out last week? Well, the big ticket release was the PSVR 2, which arrived at people's doorsteps and on shelves on the 22nd for the princely sum of 550 US dollars without any games and also without the docking station for the controllers, which is kind of a must have, to be honest. Still, despite the price tag, the word on the street is that if you are into VR and you can see yourself maybe using this more than a few times, this is basically the best consumer VR experience available right now. With a number of chunky improvements over last gen VR hardware, as well as an impressive library of day one titles, including stuff like Horizon Call of the Mountain, No Man's Sky, Resident Evil Village, and The Jewel in the Crown, Gran Turismo 7, which apparently is so good that it's likely gonna cause a shortage in steering wheels and pedals as people try and upgrade their setups. It's encouraging to see the most recent state of play lead with the announcement of five more VR titles, as well as that Resident Evil 4 VR announcement. I don't know, I guess I was kind of skeptical about this pre-launch, that the hardware wouldn't deliver, that the library of launch games wouldn't be there, or that Sony wouldn't be committed to promoting VR software post-launch. But so far, Sony have ticked every one of those boxes, so it's difficult to see the PSVR 2 as anything but a big W for Team Blue. I'm still working through my review of it since I was in Japan last week, but I do plan to have some dedicated coverage up soon. I will keep you posted. Blood Bowl 3 is that Warhammer American football crossover thing that I didn't even know existed until last week, but since then I've heard plenty about it on account of the launch kind of bombing. Right now the title sits at most negative on Steam with only 27% of reviews being positive. Apparently the game is not only blatantly unfinished from a technical and design perspective, but it's also stuffed full to bursting with in-game spending, removing key features present in prior games so they can be sold back in this one. It's a very common strategy, usually reserved for the AAA scene, so it's a genuine bummer to see smaller games indulge in this. But to be fair, this is published by Nacon, who have anything but a sterling reputation in this regard. Bottom line, apparently this really blows, steer clear. Company of Heroes 3 launched last week, but we touched on that in the previous episode. TLDR, it's really good and RTS fans are all but sure to enjoy it. PSVR 2 may have been the most talked about release of the week, but the highest selling release goes to Sons of the Forest and not by a small margin. The developers announced that in just the opening days, Sons of the Forest sold 2 million units, making it the second most successful launch of any game this year, trailing Hogwarts Legacy, of course. Thunder of the Forest is the sequel to the hit survival game The Forest, and the follow-up apparently goes just as hard as the original does. It's still early days, mind you, as this is an early access release rather than a full 1.0, but the game is already sitting at a very positive 83% on Steam with nearly 40,000 reviews counted. Reviews point to improvements across the board in terms of visuals, combat, and build mechanics, but they also point to the obviously missing content that will come later in the early access timeline. Personally, I'm waiting for 1.0 for this one, but it's nice to know that it's off to a strong start. It's available exclusively for PC at this point, unclear if it will eventually make its way to consoles, but you have to assume it will. From a successful early access launch to a not so successful early access launch, Kerbal Space Program 2 arrived this week, and let's just say it did not achieve liftoff. 
It's sitting at a mixed 51% on Steam, roughly 7,000 reviews counted. Negative reviews point to a raft of missing features present in the first game, with people wondering why this is being released in early access now if it can't even maintain feature parity with a game released a long time ago. It's also meant to be full of bugs and just a generally bad time. It's a shame. I mean, the early access tag makes sense for debut titles or for existing titles that have at least hit a baseline of performance and content commensurate with what existing fans would expect. Unsure why you'd release something that's objectively worse than the previous game, even with that early access label on it. I don't know, it seems like a real shame. But for now, you can leave Kerbal on the launch pad. Circle back to it when it's go for launch. Hope you liked all these rocket ship puns, by the way. If you do, you can send this video to the moon by clicking the like button. Okay, I went too far, I'll stop now. Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe arrived on Nintendo Switch this week. It's a little surprise to learn that it's a critical hit since everyone seems to have a soft spot for Nintendo's softest, fluffiest hero. On Open Critic, Return to Dreamland Deluxe is sitting at a strong 80, very respectable indeed. Well Played scored this one an 8.5 saying, quote, as a follow-up to the highly successful Forgotten Land, Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe may tread on old ground, but it does so with confidence and color aplenty, end quote. And finally, stop the presses. Square Enix has released a successful video game, at least critically. Octopath Traveler 2 hit all platforms last week and it appears to be an absolute banger. Steam reviews, 94% very positive, huge result. Critics, a mighty 86, love to see it. Game Informer scored this one an 8.5 saying, quote, Octopath Traveler 2 does what an excellent sequel should. Instead of breaking new ground left and right, it improves on the original in nearly every way and feels more confident about the story it tells. There's still room for improvement in some of its stiffer areas, but Octopath 2 is a sterling achievement all round, end quote. IGN 7 out of 10 is broadly reflective of the more tepid reviews saying, quote, Octopath Traveler 2 is a very enjoyable JRPG sequel that feels a little too safe and familiar, end quote. Gripes aside, it's clear that this is a win for old school JRPG fans and a bigger win for Square Enix, who desperately needed a critical darling not called Power Wash Simulator. So, grats to them. So, what's coming out this week? Lightfall, baby! Can't believe it's finally here. I'm so excited. I'm. It's like actually my most anticipated game of the year. I am not ashamed to say it. Actually, yes, I am. I'm deeply ashamed, but I'm going to say it anyway. Did you guys see that launch trailer? I think we all blew our load when the Traveler blew its load. Many a spire was forming in that moment, and days later, that spire is still fully formed. I think I should call a doctor. For those wondering if Lightfall is going to be a good jumping in point for new or lapsed players, the honest truth is nobody can tell you. There's definitely some stuff that's coming to make the game more approachable, namely a new progression system and gear loadouts, but there's some other stuff coming too that might make it a little rougher for newbies, like an increase in the baseline difficulty of the game since things got a little too easy at the bottom end of the spectrum this past few months. What's for certain is that the story is a continuation of an eight year saga that will conclude next year and the new player onboarding experience has not been touched and that really needs some work. So yeah, I wouldn't position this as the best possible entry point, probably. But for existing fans, this is shaping up to be one hell of an expansion. See you in a few weeks for my review. I will try to keep it under one hour this time, but absolutely no promises. Scars Above is a third person shooter that has a lot of souls like energy. It's slow paced, meant to be challenging, etc. I played a little bit of it a while back and I didn't love what I played. It wasn't much playtime, so please don't take my word for it. But yeah, it didn't leave a great impression. Still, if you're at all interested in checking it out for yourself, then this one drops on all platforms bar the Switch today. Leap is a game I mentioned a few weeks back on account of their console port announcement. This one hit PC some time ago. It's a competitive first person shooter, very tribes-like, owing to its aerial combat and traversal. This one hasn't picked up too much momentum over on the PC, and the reviews aren't great either. Hopefully this finds its split gate moment when it makes the jump to PlayStation and Xbox consoles on the 1st of March. Hot off the presses, Nintendo have just announced the release date for one of the weirdest fitness crossover titles since Betty White's Punch out. I made that up sadly, but I would play the ever-living shit out of that. Fitness Boxing Fist of the North Star is pretty much what it says on the tin. A boxing fitness game with a Fist of the North Star skin. You hold the Joy-Cons and punch stuff. It sounds ridiculous. It sounds awesome. It's out on the Switch on the second. Here's one I'm very bummed to not be reviewing. Wolong Fallen Dynasty. As a Team Ninja fan, as a fan of the Neo games, and of the actual Wolong demo, which I covered a few months back, I was very keen for this one. Sadly, my trip to Japan meant that I wasn't able to review it, and this week is Lightfall, which obviously takes priority. Still, I have spoken to some reviewers about this, and they're all loving it. No surprises there. This is to Neo what Sekiro was to Dark Souls. More actiony, more immediate, less focus on the RPG and the build craft stuff, and more focused on the SmackDown. Every chance this would be great, it arrives on all platforms, bar the Switch on the third, 
and it's on Game Pass. Hell of a deal. And finally, the rad looking Castlevania themed Dead Cells DLC arrives on all platforms on the 6th. It's nice looking and it's probably the closest thing we're going to get to an actual Castlevania game until Bloodstained Ritual of the Night 2, so enjoy. There was one other really well received release last week that I failed to mention, so put this on your radar. What do you think makes a good leader? Willpower? Control? Understanding? Seems like you're going to be here for some time. This is The Pale Beyond, and it's got a rather interesting origin story in that it's the first game from Bellula Studios, a studio that was set up by the YouTuber, Bellula. Dude put his money where his mouth was, pulled together some talented people, and together they made an actual video game. Much respect for that. Doesn't hurt that the game is apparently really good. It dropped last week and it's sitting at a very positive 92% on Steam with plenty of positive buzz from critics to boot. As for what the game is, it's a survival game but with a more narrative flair than what the genre is accustomed to. It's very focused on characters, dialogue and decisions. Think Frostpunk crossed with a Telltale game maybe? Probably a little crude but it gives you the gist. I'm a little busy right now, but I still bought a copy of this to show support. It's nice to see a new spin on the genre, and it's pretty awesome to see someone make the jump from YouTube commentary to actual game dev without having to resort to NFTs. This is available now on Steam. If you'd like to check it out, I've profiled it over on my Steam curator page, which also has links to all of the other put this on your radar stuff I've recently covered. I'll leave a link to all of that below the like button. Sort of free stuff time now, and boy oh boy, it is the start of a new month, which means lots of free stuff to add to your endlessly expanding library of games that you will probably never play. Kicking things off as usual is epic. Right now you can still grab sci-fi drone game Duskers, but in a few days you'll be able to get your hands on Rise of Industry, an early 20th century industrialist management sim. Will you be the next Henry Ford? I think that's Kanye actually, but we won't go there now. How about that Game Pass? A smaller update for Team Green this month. Woe Long Fallen Dynasty is certainly the tentpole offering there. Day one release for both Xbox and PC. Love to see it. F122 is on there. It's got an impressive VR mode if you have a VR headset that works with your PC. The other one is Soul Hackers 2, the Atlas JRPG that no one really talks about now since it was pretty mid apparently, well below the standards set by those Persona games. Sony announced the PS Plus lineup for March and it includes a Microsoft game. For real, Sony are giving away Minecraft Dungeons this month. You better believe that Phil Spencer will bring that up the next time he sits down with those regulators. Code Vein is also in the mix. I played a little bit of this a while ago and enjoyed it. The star of the show though is Battlefield 2014 which continues its long, slow road to redemption. Just recently, DICE reintroduced classes to the game after crudely ripping them out and replacing them with annoying Overwatch-style heroes. Word on the street is that 2042 is in a much, much better spot than it was at launch, with new content, bug fixes, design pivots, and more slowly writing a ship that capsized rather spectacularly back in 2021. God, that sounds like so long ago, doesn't it? If you want to check out how Battlefield is doing at a time when the servers are sure to be absolutely pumping, this is your chance. Final shout for the week goes to Prime Gaming, who next month are giving away Baldur's Gate Enhanced Edition with Baldur's Gate 3 on the way in August. This is a great excuse to catch up, but the games haven't aged too gracefully beyond their superb writing. Speaking of superb writing, Adios is also being given away if you feel like an emotional gut punch about a mobbed up pig farmer being forced to reckon with his misdeeds, then this is the one for you. Ladies and gentlemen, the show is running long, so we gotta be quick, but with PSVR 2 dropping this week, I thought our feel good story should relate in some way. Though to be fair, I don't imagine anyone's gonna feel good after sitting in this thing. Okay, to be fair, this isn't new and the company who tried to make it went out of business years ago. I wonder why, for who would not want to sit in this fucked up cake mixer of a contraption and have themselves shaken like a martini. This was called the MM1 and it was selling for the bargain price of $50,000. One tech journalist gave their impressions of it saying, quote, I tried it out about a year ago. You can really feel when you do things like fall off a cliff, drive alongside a wall or do a barrel roll in an aircraft, end quote. It's like, well, yeah, dude, look at it. If you can't feel what is happening while you are sitting in this thing, then you need to call a doctor or something. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was the show for the week. Like I said, Final Fantasy 16 Impressions video is live. I loved it. I love talking to the dev team. I love Japan. Please, Capcom, invite me out there to play Resident Evil 4. 
Just not this week or next because I'm kind of busy with Lightfall, okay? You've stuck around to the end and I appreciate it as always. If you enjoyed yourself today, I'd love it if you could hit the like button on the video. And if you want to come back sometime, then maybe subscribe, ding that notification bell so you'll know the minute a video is live. This week I'm working on PSVR 2. I've got a hands-on preview for another game in the works and I'm playing way too much Lightfall. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to have a good time. Thank you for stopping by and a big thanks to this week's sponsor, Squarespace. Are you an artist, photographer, or someone who works in the visual mediums? If so, I'm jealous of you. I wish I had skills like that. Imagine being able to draw something and it not look terrible. That would be cool. Anyway, if you fall into that category and you are looking to promote your work, then you might want to think about publishing a portfolio somewhere. And there's no better tool to help you do that than Squarespace. Squarespace have ready-made portfolio templates that you can select and immediately begin customizing to your personal taste. When you're happy with the design, you can begin uploading your work and it's going to look super professional because that's Squarespace's speciality, professional looking websites. It's not just about looks though. Squarespace can help you promote your work through email campaigns, through SEO tools, and through social media integration, so your work can be discovered and shared. You don't need any knowledge or experience to get started with this stuff. Squarespace have put in all the work to make the entire process so easy and so seamless, even for absolute beginners. As I mentioned earlier, Squarespace are a long running partner of this channel, three years running now actually. I really appreciate that support. Squarespace are helping me turn my passion into a career and that's what they do for a lot of people because if you want to turn your passion into a career, then a website is a really good place to start. To get started, visit squarespace.com and if you really want to get serious, visit squarespace.com forward slash skill up to get 10% off your purchase of a website or a domain name. Thanks Squarespace for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.